<laughs> well, at last, <laughs> here we are again in All Saints Parish Church, Bakewell, for another conversation uh, with John Butler, and you're very welcome. Uh, John, uh, today's uh, question is from uh, Alex, uh, who was on uh, one of the recent retreats with us, and uh, he's, uh, he sent in this question for you. Hi John, Alex here. <clears throat> Since uh, being on retreat with you, I've uh, become a lot more aware uh, of God's presence in everyday life. Not just during periods of meditation, but more during the whole day. And I've been sort of looking at Christianity and there's a lot in it that speaks to me, especially, you know, Jesus. But the one thing that I don't seem to understand is why create something called Christ? It seems to me Jesus had that total realisation of God's presence and lived from it uh, so much so that, you know, it was part of him. But he never really spoke about Christ himself and that sort of came after it. So I wondered... Maybe if you could help explain uh, what Christ means to you. Well, thank you, Alex. It's a question that I think has bothered lots of people, including myself. And I'm glad you end it with uh, what does Christ mean to me? Because uh, I also must uh, put out a caution for many people may not agree with what I'm going to say. So I'm going to say this is how I have come to understand it. And for what it's worth, this is what I'll share with you. But uh, you can be quite sure there'll be, you'll get other versions from different people. So here goes. <laughs> when I was trying to figure out uh, Christianity as a young man. I'd been taught it without any choice for 10 years at, uh, my, at school, but then I began to, when I began to think more deeply for myself, of course, I questioned it. And one of the things I discovered was in what's called the Catechism, which was part of the old prayer book. The prayer book was written in 1660-something by Cranmer. Uh, before it, uh, and which was the universal prayer book before they started modernizing it. And it answers the question, what are the sacraments? Now the sacraments are all, basically all the ceremonies of the church, including Holy Communion, where Christians take bread and wine. And it says this, sacraments are the outer and visible symbols of a inner spiritual grace. Outer and visible symbols of inner spiritual grace. Now, most if not all of us are either unable or unaccustomed to relating to the invisible, which I often refer to as the presence, the stillness, which is here and now, which cannot be seen or heard or described. and. Uh, I call it stillness because that's a, a non-contentious word where 
You can't argue about it really. You start calling it the presence of God. Somebody else will say, well, well that's not right or something. Anyway, let's call it stillness for now. Well, those that aren't used to being still, of course, they look for uh, an outer and visible sign. Um, and so uh, the church has all these various cer ceremonies and priests dress up in all these garbs, special vestments, and, uh, and, they, and there is symbolical meaning to all of it, baptism and, and, um, and all the rest, confirmation. Well, for most people that is Christianity. And it's very easy to forget that these are but outer and visible symbols of an inner spiritual grace. Now let's come back to this stillness, here now. What's meant by grace? Well, perhaps you could just use the word availability. Because it's here, isn't it? And you don't have to do anything to get it. You just open up awareness. And here it is, this invisible, what I like to refer to as presence, stillness, or space, silence. And what's the difference between that and spirit, or presence? Where does one end and the other begin? their levels of intensity or intensity of reception of aware our awareness of it that might lead one to use one word or another to describe it. But you can, we can't really describe it, can we? Any more than we can describe freedom or peace or love. Now those of us that are well practiced in meditation and in being aware of mindfulness uh, can, uh, can acquire, as Alex describes, a, a familiarity with this. It seems almost obvious. It's like an invisible friend that never leaves us. And then words of Jesus such as, I am with you always, make perfect sense. It's just absolute fact, fact of experience everyday experience. And really there's no need to call it anything. <laughs> and we don't have to draw pictures of it to describe it, it's just a matter of being it. And it's funnily enough those people that do experience it usually have a sort of peace about them whether they mean to or not. There's a certain sort of body language that people say Oh, there's something about that chap. He seems sort of settled in himself, something like that. That's how someone described me the other day. I thought it was rather a good way of putting it. Settled in yourself. In contrast to the usual situation of being at odds with oneself and certainly with the world about one. Well, is this Jesus? Why not? We, you know, people could perhaps will say yes, I would say no, so what? It makes no difference really, does it? <laughs> we can just laugh at these arguments. <laughs> There's another feature of this stillness, you see, is that it's undivided. There are not two of them. There's only one stillness, isn't there? I mean, it's obvious, isn't it? So where does all the fuss and bother, all the argument come from? Well, you see, Here's you, there's Phil sitting over there, and there's me here. So there are two people, aren't there? But one stillness. Now when our focus leaves this one stillness and becomes sort of, once again, embedded in you and me, that makes two, doesn't it? One called Phil and another called John. 
one called Jesus and somebody else called something else. And this is called duality. But really it makes no difference whatsoever to the stillness, does it, or the presence. If there are a dozen people here, all called by different names, there's still only one stillness, one presence. And they could all argue about themselves, who's the greatest spiritual teacher? And, and you know, interesting, I was born then and then and did this and that. And, but it just, it's just the play of the world, really. This is duality. And hence arise all human problems, all human questions and arguments. Because in this stillness, there is no question, is there? No argument. It is beyond name and form. It is nameless and formless. But that's nothing difficult, but so is peace, isn't it? So is freedom. So is love and happiness. So these aren't difficult philosophical questions that anybody can't understand. It's very simple. Now then, these questions about Christ, well, indeed, well, first thing to recognize is that they all arise from duality. Because when you're actually in this spiritual presence, there are no questions. So these things just don't, they don't, uh, they don't appear, they don't bother you. These things are of the world. Now, a feature of the world, in other words, you and me, is that men always want to make something. <laughs> we find ourselves in different bodies and so we dress our bodies differently and we comb our hair differently. <laughs> and, <you> know, <laughs> and as we're brought up, we pick up all sorts of different conditioning. So we're all as different as chalk and cheese, aren't we? In the worldly sense. Um, but again, the spiritual work consists in constantly coming back to this utter simplicity of just here, now, present, this undivided one. The stillness, unshakable, indivisible, unquestionable. So really, unless you particularly want to dive into all the complexities of theology and what is or isn't Christ or Christianity, there's no need to. But it's much easier not to. <laughs> Because <laughs> if you do get involved in that, <laughs> you'll probably forget all about presence and get in a muddle and find someone else who doesn't think the same as you and then get upset about it. So why not just leave it alone? There's much safety, you know, in not knowing. And First of all, there's this utter simplicity, which is, you can say, which is not made by man. That's a favorite term used in orthodoxy, by the way. Nirukot vorni, which means not made by man. And there's another world, as it were, made by man. And in man, are all the problems of the world. And religion. Yes, you're, Alex, you're quite right, as far as I know. And I, and Jesus said nothing very much about, he never mentioned Christianity, did he? I'm not sure there's not one mention of Christ from his mouth, but um, I'm not too sure of my facts here, but I think Christ it means something like the Anointed One. Um, it was a sort of a title given by the Jews, or used in that sense. Um, I believe Jesus also uh, is connected to the meaning of I Am, that basic name 
by which God reveals himself, and which you and I use in every other sentence, I am this or that, I am Phil or I am John, which is, of course, the true I am, which I am, which is synonymous with what is present here, this invisible spirit, which remains when all the I am not, in other words, this mortal flesh and this, this uh, variable mind die out and die away. So that Jesus, the I am, the divinity, is in every man. You can call it the self, the true self, that self lives in the heart of all. This is Jesus, always with us, here and now. We can never be closer to Jesus than here and now. There's another funny thing. <laughs> it seems funny if you can't really believe it at first, because when you actually rest in this stillness, you are complete, aren't you? There's just total completeness. <laughs> no more desires, no more questions. <laughs> you can forget about it. You've forgotten about the body and its aches and pains. So you just forget about it and you become, you just merge into this spiritual completion, which is what I am. Home. And this is what's meant, again, in my understanding, by salvation. We are saved from this ocean, this ocean of, of extras, if you like, this ocean of what I'm not, this bottomless pit of complexity called the world. <laughs> we're, as it were, plucked up by the hair <laughs> and popped down on the side. Of, of this of this well <laughs> and discover the freedom of just pure I am salvation from the world the flesh and the devil which is of course the ego the I me and mine the separate ego which thinks it's separate from this presence this divine presence this is what we are but what we truly are Find that, my dears, and the search is ended, and you can leave all the questions behind. Does that answer your question, Alec? <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> oh, thank you, John. Uh, that was a very helpful and clear and direct answer to Alex's question, I think. Uh, uh, you won't be surprised to hear that it's doesn't answer <laughs> all of my questions. <laughs> I can trump that with one more <laughs> if you if you are if you are willing. Uh, uh, of course, um, uh, this might simply be uh, Phil's mind working over time again. But one of the things that Alex alludes to uh, in his question is. Uh, the distinction between Jesus, the man, the historical person, and the Christ, the, 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 the theological figure and the meaning of that. And I think um, you cannot dismiss Christianity uh, by uh, simply uh, side, uh, exit stage left, the Christ figure by saying that it, it doesn't need not apply. All, all we need is this stillness, this uh, Jesus aspect. So uh, without digging theological holes, uh, I'd like to ask you just to comment on this distinction between uh, the Jesus person and uh, the Christ figure? Well, I'm not sure really that I'm qualified to 
do more than offer a bit of my own experience uh, rather than attempt a comprehensive answer to this. Um, it's not something that particularly interests me, really. I tend to switch off from these religious complications. Um, but I've, I've said it several times before on these videos, but I'll repeat it as it seems uh, appropriate to the question. One of uh, my very early understandings came when I was a farmer, a young farmer in my early twenties, and I had to face the, the, the situation that my lambs, I had sheep then, that my lambs went to be slaughtered, and that my feet crushed the grass when I walked upon it. So what did all this mean? And then I remembered the phrase, the Lamb of God. So I remember that came to me very strongly when I saw my first lambs born one early one morning. Lamb of God. What is that? And why does this lovely little newborn lamb end up a few months later going to be slaughtered? So that we may eat it. Well, what's that got to do with Christ? Well, immediately I thought, well, it's got an awful lot to do with Christ. This is Christ. Because this is the pure and innocent being sacrificed for you and me. And I saw myself, instead of being the, the sort of master and, uh, <laughs> you know, the most important man on my farm, as the destroyer, as the worst man on my farm, the worst creature. I was the parasite on my lovely land. Um, I helped it as I could, but also I was both the creator and destroyer of my farm. Um, so this made me think more about what am I and, and what sin is, what's meant by sin. And I was just beginning, I think, then to get a, 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 a taste of what it meant to be spiritual, to be a spirit instead of a man of flesh and blood. A spirit like a fairy, even, which I used to think a lot about in those days, still do, which, uh, which could skip over the grass without bruising it sit on a flower without destroying it and of course didn't need to kill lambs to eat. Well, what am I doing with these great heavy heavy boots crushing the grass and sending off my lambs? Christ. Christ came into the world to save sinners. Well of course because I have fallen from that spiritual estate into this world of mortality of corruptibility. Um, pure nature is sacrificed to keep me in existence, to feed me. As is only too obvious in the world today, the whole world is being destroyed and sacrificed so that humanity can continue. And never mind if we all become vegans, we're still going to destroy the plants. <laughs> because man in his, in his origin is this spiritual I am. And we have fallen in consciousness from that, lower and lower into what we, into embodiment, engrossment in flesh, incorruptible and mortal flesh and blood, whose only destiny is death. Hmm? So the whole of nature is cursed by this, which is called sin, this fall from grace, from light into darkness. Again, as I've often demonstrated, there's light, isn't it? And there's darkness. We, we've done. We've turned from God to darkness, and caused all the trouble because we're ignorant. So we have to ask questions. By the way, <laughs> down to the light. There's no question, is there? You see. <laughs> so, this is Christ. 
So Jesus immediately expanded for me far beyond going to church on Sunday to something that was a spiritual reality. My goodness me, that made me stand up and think. Goodness, it all moved into an altogether, took a few steps upward, took on a new meaning, became something real instead of what I think I was told to be, taught to me in school that I was meant to believe by going through these weekly rituals. Um, Christ, well, Christ is indeed the the saviour from our sin. It was only too obvious to me at that time. If you think of Jesus as this presence, you see, this presence is in what we call the world, isn't it? The world, which is this man-made ignorance, mm. this mortality, mortality mm. describes it. Th this, this oneness finds itself in you and me as two mortal beings. In other words, Jesus is in the world. Jesus is incarnate in the world. And of course, it's not just you and me, it's not just people, it's in everything. It's in every plant, every animal. It's uh, universal. Jesus is the universal, the divine spark in everyone. Um, and of course, he's crucified because of it. If you don't put up on a cross, you, you, you suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, and sooner or later you corrupt and you, you rot away and die. So we're all of us in our way crucified. We all of us are, have to follow the way, the way of the cross, follow Christ. Christ is, is presented to us as the example. Well, that's splendid. If many people go no further than that, they don't really relate it very much to themselves. But, um, but if you do, the whole thing becomes greatly expanded, very much more meaningful, at least to me it, it has done. Can I ask, John, what is the role of belief? Because it seems to be as, uh, sort of required. In fact, part of the, well, the, the Anglican service anyway is called the credo, which is uh, I believe. And this, is it, is it necessary to believe in Jesus as the Saviour or he just is? Well, some people think it is. Um, and again, I've, I've never been very keen on, on uh, on belief, on the creed. I remember I had a monk friend at one time who was also a meditator and uh, had spent many years in India and had learnt a lot uh, out there. And, um, and he took me through the creed and we sort of stripped it down and he, showed, <laughs> he sort of enlightened me as I'd never been before. Instead of just repeating it like a parrot, he really explained some of these things to me. And since then I've become I've sort of figured a lot out for myself and, um, well, you see, a lot of people, they don't want to think for themselves, do they? And they don't, um, they don't probably have much direct experience and they just find it comfortable to repeat the, these things that they're told to repeat and they get some comfort from doing so. And, um, well, you know, not a lot of people are like that. If you, but if you want to go, if you want to go beyond that, then, God bless you. <laughs> I recommend you do. Can I be outrageous and suggest, therefore, that uh, believing in uh, Jesus as the Saviour is a convenient, God-provided shortcut? Ah, oh, now wait a minute. God-provided, there is the question. Is it God-provided or is it man-provided? Now then, uh, yes. Now, religion is very questionable whether it's God provided, or is it man provided? Now then. <laughs> I think that's enough said on that, isn't it? Not quite. <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm not going to let you off the hook if just yet. Back, if you go back into Christian history, there have been endless arguments about the creed. People have gone to war over the creed. In fact, it was a one of the clause, one of the sentences in the creed about the Holy Ghost proceeding from the Father and the Son was was the basic reason why the why back in uh, whatever year it was, three or four hundred, I think, um, the, what the Roman Church split off from the Eastern Church, which was in Constantinople. So you've got two great branches of Christianity now, Orthodoxy in the East and, and, uh, and the Western Church, uh, which was based in Rome, and then the Protestants broke off, and now some Christian sects don't use it at all, do they? People like the Quakers, they don't have a creed, don't think it necessary. So, you see, all this confusion arises from man. In God there is no confusion, and if you don't doubt what I say, just come back here, feet on your floor, bottom on the chair, listen and look, and you'll find this utter simplicity of presence, stillness or presence, where none of these, you know, you can just smile at these questions because they're just like children's toys, really. But, of course, every religion um, are adamant <laughs> that their belief is the right one and their God is the only one. Well, yes, well, that's the foolishness of man, isn't it? And men have been like this about everything, whether it's right or wrong to eat meat or Brexit or all these things. This is just duality. This is just the human condition lost in thought. Thinkery, thinkery, thunk. It's all of it utter bunk. So just sit still and show some will, not thinkery, thinkery, thunk.